All right, let me start recording this again here. And here, okay, so that's all, yep, that's recording nicely. This is recording, okay, yeah, sorry about that, guys. Um, yeah, this is the very, very last week of content for um, Fundamentals of Biochemistry. So you've all, um, now actually last check, I believe almost everyone had submitted their assignment, which is fantastic. There we go. Yeah, pretty much everyone has submitted their assignment. Look, I'm going to talk more about that in the Tute Workshop this afternoon, um, just because that's just easier. Um, but yeah, let us get started on looking at membrane transport. So what are our, whoops, what are our goals for today? What are we trying to do? We're going to be looking at the selective permeability of membranes, which again, um, shouldn't be, shouldn't be too difficult. We're not going to be focusing too, 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 too much on that. Um, we're going to be looking at the main methods in which molecules move, especially across, um, a lipid bilayer. Um, so none of this should be, uh, brand new to you guys. You should have learned it, um, uh, in, in previous courses, but we're just going to sort of recap and, and rehash on that. We're then going to um, look at what facilitated diffusion means. We're going to be looking at active transport, secondary active transport, and look at why it is so important uh, and, and useful within biological systems. So on that note, let's get started. So transport across a cell membrane. Now I've, I've mentioned extensively that, you know, cell membranes are obviously very important for, um, you know, keeping things out or holding things in, sort of segmenting uh, different compartments of a cell. That's all well and good, but we don't want, um, we don't want those walls to be just purely impenetrable. It, it completely defeats the point. Okay, we want things to be able to move in, we want things to be able to move out, but what is most important there is that we want to be able to control, to the best of our abilities, what we can move in and what we can move out. Now, something that's very important to take note of here is that cell membranes are permeable to small non-polar molecules. Um, now, obviously the lipid bilayer um, has the hydrophilic head, hydrophobic core, but what can happen is with sort of small, um, non-polar molecules is that they can actually move straight through um, the, the lipid bilayer. Uh, but again, we're going to talk about that a little bit more um, in a moment. Um, so transport across this membrane can be facilitated by proteins. Okay, so we can use sort of different um, pumps or channels uh, or pores or things like that. Um, and typically, yeah, these proteins are called transporters or they're called permeases. Now, when we're looking at this, um, at, at the membranous transport, the big thing to sort of keep in mind here is just ask yourself, is this process using energy? Yes or no? That's the best way to sort of start this classification um, process. I do that every time. <laughs> Um, so the first thing is if we're looking at the types of diffusion that do not use energy, these do not use ATP. The first one is just regular passive diffusion. Okay. Now the definition for passive diffusion is the movement of a solute from, or the movement of a substance from high concentration to low concentration down its chemical gradient or down its concentration gradient. Okay. It does not require energy and I'll explain how this happens in a moment. The next one that also doesn't require energy is facilitated diffusion. Now keep an eye out, try not to get these two confused, okay, or, or muddled up. So facilitated diffusion, it's almost identical to the definition of diffusion. It is the movement of a, a solute or a substance from high concentration to low concentration down its concentration gradient. That's literally word for word what I set up here. But, but... It is mediated by a carrier protein or channel protein. What this means is, is that it needs, it needs help. It needs a, a protein of some sorts to transport it across. It's still moving down its concentration gradient. It still does not require energy, but it can't just move through willy nilly. It needs something to help carry it through. 
And the last one here is active transport. So this is the, uh, if we're looking at energy consumption, this one is the odd one out because this one requires energy. This one needs ATP in order to work. And we're gonna be looking at an example of all three of these. So active transport is the movement of a solute from low to high. So it's going against its concentration gradient. And it's typically done by, uh, or, or you know, these, uh, the, the active transport is driven by either sort of ion gradients, um, or it can be looking at ATP hydrolysis. This one's probably the main one here. So in a nutshell, sort of keeping it nice and simple, this is what we're going to be looking at here um, today. So you've got our concentration gradient. We've got high concentration to low concentration. Simple diffusion of a uh, non-polar molecule can just move straight through. Um, or if there's a gap or a hole in the membrane, it can move straight through. Um, however, we can also have these channel proteins here that, um, uh, that are channel or carrier mediated. So channel mediated, meaning like a ligand's got to bind to it to activate it, so then it moves through. Or our carrier mediated mean only certain things can fit into um, this protein before it moves through. Uh, again, I'm going to explain all these more in a, in a moment. Um, then, of course, we've got um, active transport. This is going the opposite direction. This is going against that concentration gradient. And because we're pushing it against that concentration gradient, we need to use energy. Now, just looking at this... Um, not a graph, a flowchart, rather. Um, what we are essentially going to be looking at here um, today is we're going to be looking at... Diffusion, simple, uh, now simple or passive diffusion, they mean the exact same thing. I don't care which one you use, just be consistent. We're going to look at facilitated uh, diffusion, secondary active transport, and primary active transport. And that's where we'll stop. I'm not going to worry about um, transport of membrane-bound vesicles, so endocyto uh, endocytosis, exocytosis, or pint um, pintocytosis, or phagocytosis, any of those ones. Um... We're just gonna we're just gonna stick to these main methods of transport here. So, molecular kinetic theory is an important aspect that really you know shines a light into how passive diffusion works. So, a couple of things that we need to be aware of here is that when we have a gas, um, oops, sorry, when we have a, a a gas that's moving around in a container, the big thing is is that it is entirely unpredictable. If we were to look at one gas molecule, we can't predict where it's going to go, okay? But we can predict where many gas particles are going to move. Now, a good way to sort of think about this is imagine that we are in a helicopter and we're looking over a huge crowd, like a massive, massive, massive crowd. Um, let's say a massive crowd in the streets of Brisbane. Yeah, they've just... Right in the CBD, everyone is there. It's packed. I cannot just point to one individual person and say, hey, look, see the guy with the backwards cap there? I bet you he's going to move in this direction. But you can predict how the crowd itself is going to move. It's the same thing here. Now, um, a couple of other things to keep in mind is that the molecules, when they bounce off a container, are... Um, completely elastic. Now, what I mean by that is that the molecule will hit the, the wall of the container and then bounce back off at the with, with no energy lost or expended. Um, if I was to turn around and run at a wall, I would not have such luck. There would be a, a large amount of energy uh, expended by the noise of me smashing into a wall <laughs> and me falling down and yelling. Um, so these are constantly bouncing. They're constantly moving around within their container. Um, now, if we were to then heat up these molecules, if I was to say, um, take this sort of box down here and put a massive like fire underneath it. If I was to um, start to heat this up, what we would notice is that that, um, that heat will move into the container. Okay, that sort of thermal energy. And what will happen is that these molecules then will then have an increase in their kinetic energy. They will start to move around faster and faster because they're getting getting hotter. And because of that, they will then collide and hit with the surface of the container with a much greater force. This is why they always say you never, ever, ever like 
put a a deodorant can in uh in a in a campfire or something like that just as an instance because it is a gas that is in a pressurized container and if you heat it up it will it will explode now in terms of how fast these molecules will move the rule of thumb is is that the hotter the molecule the faster it's going to move okay the more we heat it up the more energy we give it it's going to yeah, it's going to be moving faster. Now, the bigger the molecules are, the slower they are to move. Now, again, a good way to think about this is comparing, say, the energy needed to get a 18-wheeler truck with a trailer up to 50k an hour versus getting a motorbike to 50 kilometers an hour. One will get to 50 kilometers an hour a lot quicker and with far less sort of fuel consumed than the other one. But one is a lot smaller and a lot lighter than the other one. Yeah. So the truck will take way more energy to really get up to speed um, just because it's bigger and it's, and it's heavier. Uh, okay. So a lot of these things is what we we're already um, explaining before. And it is this mo uh, molecular kinetic theory that really governs this movement and diffusion of, um, uh, 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 of these molecules in a solution. Like it could be a gas or sort of a, a solute that's being dissolved here. Um, now again, it has to be a net movement of, um, <laughs> granny versus 18 wheeler when it gets to 50 kilometer faster. <laughs> Man, my money's on the grannies. Those grannies are ridiculous, man. They will roll you. <laughs> I'll have to remember that for, uh, for next time. Oh, dear. So when we're looking at our um, passive diffusion or passive transport here, um, it will always move from high concentration to low concentration until an equilibrium is, is formed. And what's also important to note is that over short different uh, distances, like microscopic distances, diffusion is really quick. It's really fast. But as you move further and further away, it does slow right down. And this really ties back to uh, how we were talking about like hemoglobin and myoglobin and why we even needed that entire complicated uh, system in the first place. Because it's all well and good if it's in a sort of microscopic distance for diffusion. You know, this is why sort of bacteria and other, you know, microscopic organisms don't have a, a, a circulatory network and, you know, hemoglobin and lungs and all this sort of stuff. Whereas we as humans definitely do need it because we are far bigger. Um, where are we? Yeah. So what's also important to note here, again, it will continue to do this until equilibrium is, um, is reached. These are just sort of some, uh, some cool rules of thumb. Uh, okay. Now looking at diffusion, we've looked at sort of movement of, um, a substance. I now want to have a look at a movement of water across a membrane. Okay. There are three main ways in which water can move through the lipid bilayer. The first one is diffusion through the membrane by sort of gaps in the lipid bilayer. Again, this is pretty limited because it's not very often that you see a, a you know, a big gap or a hole in the lipid bilayer. Um, however, it does, you know, it can happen that way. Uh, the next one is diffusion through the um, the the uh, lipid bilayer by using specific channels. And, and an example I've used here is called aquaporin. So aquaporin is a uh, protein channel. It's an integral protein that is um, put into the distal convoluted tubules and the collecting ducts of the kidneys. And what's important here is that when a hormone called ADH is released, um, so that's antidiuretic hormone, this is released typically, you know, if you've got low uh, blood volume, very dehydrated sort of thing, um, what your kidneys and inside the nephron will actually do is it will take this protein called aquaporin and will insert it in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct of that nephron for the purpose of increasing overall water reabsorption. So that instead of uh, water that's moving through your nephron in your kidney going straight through into uh, basically your ureter and your bladder to be stored as urine we are instead reabsorbing that water back into our um, blood circulation and um 
you know, essentially, yeah, right, we're holding onto that water. This is how, uh, or one way uh, in which we can concentrate our, um, our urine. Uh, and the third method that uh, water can sort of move um, across the membrane, whether it's into or out of, is pinocytosis, okay? Um, so essentially, this is just looking at a vesicle that has um, uh, water in, in the center of it. Now, osmosis. Osmosis is incredibly, incredibly important, okay? Osmosis is the diffusion or the movement of water from high water to low water across a semi-permeable membrane. Now, uh, you, you've got to be really careful here because we can look at and define this in two different ways. We can look at it as um, a water concentration or we can look at it as a salt concentration. Now, I'm going to present both to you and I just recommend that you memorize and use the one that you feel the most comfortable with. So, for instance, if we have two water solutions here. And we've got a semi-permeable membrane, meaning that water can move through, but salt can't. And what we have here with sort of solution A is a 20% salt solution. And what we have here is a 10% salt solution. So if we look at this 20% salt solution, that means it's 20% salt and 80% water. And with this 10% salt solution, it means it is 10% salt and 90% water. So what we see is with uh, osmosis, it is the movement of water from a high concentration of water to a low concentration of water, which means it's going to be 90% water versus 80% water. So it's gonna to wanna to move this way or you can think of it as a low solute concentration to a high solute concentration. So low solute, 10% sodium chloride to high solute, 20% sodium chloride. Now, again, it can, it can be a bit confusing because it's like low to high for water, but it's high to low for solute. But what's important to keep in mind here is that it's a, it's a percentage. You know, if I have way more solute, I'm going to have less uh, sorry, if I have way more solute, I'm going to have far less water in there. Okay. In, in terms of sort of just pure ratio. Um, so yeah, the movement of water is governed by the solute concentration and looking at osmosis and looking at osmolarity, um, that is a huge factor in terms of how we control movement of water in our body and how we detect how much water we actually have. So for instance, in our hypothalamus, we have uh, osmoreceptors in there that essentially detect and measure how salty the, uh, you know, our, our blood is and will, you know, if it's getting too salty, it's basically saying, hey, we're, we're dehydrated. We need to do something about this. And it will, you know, try to retain water by, uh, you know, reducing amount of um, urine formation. It will make you feel thirsty and trigger you to have a drink such as my hypothalamus is doing right now. Um, but yeah, so that is osmosis, okay? It's the movement of water through a semi-permeable membrane from high water to low water, um, and is really driven by that solute concentration. Uh, this one. Now, as I mentioned before, um, looking at osmosis and looking at the, you know, sort of salt concentration um, in the body, this is a main way uh, in which the body controls um, water movement. Now, there are three main areas in the body. Oh, excuse me. Uh, there are three main areas in the body in which we move water sort of into or out of. The first one is the intracellular space, so intracellular fluid. The second one is our interstitial fluid. So this is the fluid that is outside of the cell, but is sort of surrounding our tissues. And the third one is um, intravascular fluid. So this is like your blood plasma, essentially. Now, what is also important to note here is the salt concentration of our blood. We have a physiological salt uh, concentration of 0.9%. That is what our blood is. That is what we want. And this is why if you are, um, 
uh, like severely dehydrated or you've had uh, significant blood loss, anything like that, you go to the hospital and they give you a saline solution, which is salty water. They don't go, wow, he's really dehydrated. Let's give him just water. Someone turn on the tap and let's just put water in his, in his veins. <laughs> that's, that's very bad. Please don't do that. Can I? Oh, I can fit here. Very good. So there are three new terms here I'm going to describe in terms of tonicity. So again, tonicity is just describing the osmosis or, or, or the sort of osmotic gradient that can be generated within living cells. The first one is isotonic. So what does isotonic mean? It means, okay, you've gone to the hospital and they've given you a saline solution that is 0.9%. Good. Now what this essentially is, is it, it is the same salt concentration that we are at. So it means is osmosis occurring as in the movement of water? Yes. But what is happening is the movement of water into the cell and the movement of water out of the cell are equal, which means the net movement of water into and out of the cell is equal. I hope that makes sense. Again, please let me know guys, interrupt me, type something if you're, if you're not quite sure. Now, the next term here is hypertonic. Now, what this tells us is that this is when the cell has a lower salt concentration compared to the, the ECF, okay? Or it has more water inside of the cell than what it does outside of the cell. So what will happen is that by osmosis, water will be dragged out of the cell and will cause the cell to sort of shrink down. So if we look here, this is isotonic. So we can see equal sort of salt concentration, um, both inside and outside of the cell. So that means water is gonna be freely moving in and out and in and out like equally. Now hypertonic, this is concentrated salt solution. So what's gonna happen here is that we can see outside of the cell, there's way more salt. So what that is going to do is actually drag and pull water outside of the cell and it's going to cause the cell to shrivel and, and, and sort of shrink in. And that process is called crenation. Um, in health science, in another course I, I do teach in, um, CTR, so cells, tissues, regulation, what we actually uh, do in the lab is that we give um, a small vial of sort of sheep's blood and we put that on a um, microscope slide and we put different salt solutions, um, just, you know, different salty water solutions onto those red blood cells. And you can like watch it under the microscope and you can actually watch this process occur. You can see these red blood cells look sort of nice and plump like this. And then they just slowly start to shrink in as the water is being pulled out of the cell. Um, this also happens when you're very, when you're dehydrated essentially, um, is that the water inside of your cells will be pulled out into that interstitial space. And then again, by the same principle of osmosis, it can then be pulled out of the interstitial space into your blood vessels. And it's a constant balancing act between, you know, the, the fluid balance inside your, um, like blood vessels. So looking at your blood plasma, the interstitial space and inside of the cells. So this is also another big reason why we don't drink seawater. If you are stranded and there's only the ocean and you are very thirsty and you're tempted for a drink, don't drink it. <laughs> Okay, because it will actually pull water out of your body and will dehydrate you faster because of this um, osmotic gradient. Now, the next one here is hypotonic. So let's say again, we're in the hospital. We, uh, you're very dehydrated. You've been, um, you've been uh, stabbed or something. <laughs> okay, you just lost all this blood. Um, you're also dehydrated. So what do we do? Okay. We're not going to turn around and give you a, a, a bag of salty water. That will definitely make things worse. In the same sense, we're also not going to just turn around and get sort of um, distilled water and just put that in your veins. Hey, it's more water. It must be better, right? No, because what you can do is then have sort of a hypotonic solution. And what will happen is water will move from the outside of the cells into your cells but it won't stop. It will keep going, okay? It will just, because of this osmotic gradient, it will just pull heaps and heaps and heaps of water into the cell to the point where it will explode, which again is another fun thing to do when you add, you know, uh, I think it was like 0.05% um, salty water onto the um, 
onto the red blood cells. And again, you can watch them just, you'll, you'll sort of go, hang on, where have all my red blood cells gone? I can only just see carnage and bits and pieces because they literally would just pop and explode. Not something you really want uh, happening to your cells. <laughs> so hypertonic is when it will shrink and, and, and sort of shrivel up because water is being pulled out of the cell. Isotonic is the equivalent salt concentration. So it means there's an uh, equal net movement into and out of. And hypotonic is um, where there's a higher salts concentration inside of the cell, so water's gonna go rushing in. How I personally remember it, okay? Um, these cells here are very round, okay? They're very round. Uh, oh God. Now what else is very round? Hippos. <laughs> Hippos are very round. So I just think like hippo? <laughs> Uh, you know, hippos are big and round, so uh, hypotonic reminds me of hippos, and that's how you get big round cells. Don't judge me. <laughs> that's that's one stupid way that I use to to remember them anyway. Um, so yeah, that's that's our three main sort of tonicities here: isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. Okay, so looking at membrane transport proteins. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, so we have sort of carriers, we have permeases and, and transporters, stuff like that. So these will sort of, um, bind the, the solute or the thing being transported to the, um, transporter. And then what you'll see is sort of, um, a, a typically a kind of conformational change, which will move it either into, uh, sorry, here into or out of the, the cell. And that's what we're looking at, um, here. So, uh, for instance, we've got a, uh, our carrier protein here. We've got whatever this is being transported. So it's um, exposed to the extracellular surface. Whatever it is that's being transported will bind to the transporter, conformational change, and it's spat out on the other end. Now, the other option here is looking at sort of channel proteins. And what these will do is sort of form a, a pore in the, the cell membrane so that once it's open, Anything that is um, either a, a, a specific charge or a specific size will be able to flood through. So the probably the main one that at least I know I've spoken about, but maybe in other courses that you guys have done, uh, would be your sort of voltage-gated channels. So like your voltage-gated sodium, potassium, or calcium channels, like you would see with that, your action potentials and, and whatnot. That's that's a good example of a, of a channel protein. Now, here's something that's very important to keep in mind, okay? What we have here, uh, sorry, I, I will refer to this one, with either channel mediated or carry, or especially carrier mediated is these are types of facilitated diffusion, okay? It needs to use one of these two proteins here in order to move from outside the cell to inside the cell. Now, what is very important to keep in mind as well is that with facilitated diffusion, it is saturable. Now, I know you guys are just getting so keen and, and so excited. Speaking of grannies, here they are again, because we see a lot of overlap here. We see a lot of overlap with facilitated diffusion as we saw with enzymes. So, because we can look at a transport protein and look at the rate in which it's being transported, this follows a similar uh, method of the michaelis menten equation. We have our Vmax. We have the maximum rate in which, um, you know, a, a substance is being transported. So if we look at these different terms, and I'm just going to use, say, a GLUT1 transporter. So like looking at a glucose transporter, just as an example here. Um, we have Vmax. So Vmax for enzymes was the maximum rate of reaction of an enzyme. For facilitated diffusion, obviously it's not an enzyme, but that same meaning carries across. This is the maximum rate in which this transport protein can move glucose from out of, outside the cell to inside the cell. And then you've also got Km. Now, what was Km? Well, Km was one half of V max. Exactly the same with glucose and these glucose transporters, okay? Um, however, just keep in mind, there are, depending on the source that you look up, uh, and this is what I'm saying over here, 
is that with, if you're looking at, say, facilitated diffusion, um, there are different websites or different sources will refer to it as KT, not KM. Uh, and I think that's just to prevent confusion between facilitated diffusion and enzymes, but just keep in mind that they are the exact same thing, okay? Um, KM is one half of VMAX, KT is one half of VMAX. And what I'm sort of just trying to show you here is that that same uh, theory that applied to enzymes also applies to facilitated diffusion because they follow the same principles. Um, you have a, a, a solute or you have a, a substrate binds to a protein or enzyme and something happens and then it leaves again. And that's what we're looking at here. And you can see the difference in speed, the rate of glucose uptake. Look at the difference between passive diffusion, which I mean, hmm, it's not, it's not great. It's not great. Versus facilitated diffusion. Huge, huge difference. Now, something I want to be very clear about so that you guys aren't having a heart attack. When it comes to, you know, kinetics and looking at, um, you know, KM and VMAX and blah, blah, blah. Please be aware that in an exam or an assessment case, I will only give you things like KM and VMAX and... KCAT and all that sort of stuff in enzymes, okay? I will not give you anything like this in terms of VMAX and doing any calculations for facilitated diffusion. I 100% think that you all could definitely do uh, calculations like that because it's the exact same thing, but I don't want to, um, I guess, murky the waters or, or sort of um, make it more confusing or, or more difficult for you guys. So, what I'm essentially showing you guys here is, is one, the same thing that you learned in enzymes does apply to facilitated diffusion. Two, look at the speed difference or the, the, the change in rate of facilitated versus passive. Massive difference. And thirdly, in the same way that VMAX is being achieved with an enzyme because it's it's saturated, okay, it, it means it's working as fast as it can. There's no more left for the substrate to bind. The exact same thing applies to facilitated diffusion. It can be saturated. Those are the three main things I'm sort of trying to get across in this slide. Oh, here we go. <laughs> so you can same, use the same methods uh, taught in enzymes to convert a rate. You can do a, a, a line weaver Burke plot, okay, or a double reciprocal plot. Again, you can do the exact same thing here. But instead of it being enzymes, it's just facilitated diffusion. Again, I'm not going to quiz you on that, but just please do keep that in mind. So facilitated versus passive, okay? Passive diffusion, it's still high solute to low solute. So it's facilitated, high solute to low solute, but it needs the use of a protein carrier or a protein transporter. Next thing. Three main features that differentiate between these two. One, facilitated diffusion is much higher than passive diffusion in terms of its rate, okay? It is much faster. Oh, excuse me. Um, in the same way too that we saw with enzymes and the specificity of enzymes, we can also see that same specificity for facilitated diffusion, which our body can definitely use for its advantage. Now, uh, and the third point here is that the transport, because it needs to bind to this protein in order to obviously be transported, um, it can become saturated. So those are the three main takeaway messages here in terms of comparing facilitated diffusion to passive diffusion. Okay, let's now have a look at the three sort of main classes of transporter here. The first one is we have a uni porter. Again, this should be sort of relatively straightforward. Uni meaning one, okay? So port to transport. So uni port just means it moves one molecule at a time um, and will typically be down its concentration gradient. So an example here is like glute one um, transporter, which is kind of what I was explaining uh, previously. <laughs> 
The next one is a sim porter. So this is where you have the movement of multiple um, substrates or multiple substances, but they are both moving in the same direction. Antiporter, again, two things are being uh, transported, but they're moving in opposite directions. Now I'm gonna give an example of all three of those. Um, well, right, right now. So GLUT1, looking at GLUT1 transporters, um, this is the protein that is, um, uh, that is pushed onto the cell surface in the presence of insulin. So if you guys have had a big, yummy, sugary meal, or you've just had lunch, uh, it's about 2.15. Yeah, let's say most of you sort of had lunch. You know, your body is um, releasing um, uh, insulin now because you've got lots of glucose that's being digested and absorbed into your, your bloodstream and your body's wanting to take advantage of that. So what it will do is it will um, push these glute transporters into the cell surface. And then uh, we can see here that they're exposed to the outside of the cell, which makes sense because the goal, what we're trying to do here is take our glucose and move it into the cell. So what is happening here in terms of the, the steps in terms of the pathway is that glucose will bind to the extracellular surface of this glute transporter. Once it is bound, it's going to cause a conformational change. So again, conformational change, meaning a change to its overall shape. And instead of facing outside, it is now facing inside where glucose will be released. And then upon the release of glucose, it will change its conformation again and face the outside. Nice and straightforward. Now, Symporter is where two things are moving in the same direction, but I actually don't want to explain Symporters just yet. I'm going to talk about the sodium glucose uh, Symporter in a moment um, when we explain secondary active transport. Now, the last one here is looking at antiporters. So antiporters is when uh, one thing moves in, another thing moves out. So the example I have here is just looking at, um, at calcium. So um, what we see here is the exchange of sodium and calcium. And this is especially important when we're looking at um, cardiac muscle because that calcium exchange is very important for the um, plateau phase of the action potential. Um, to basically allow blood to move through the heart um, while it's sort of uh, it, it, while it's beating, essentially. Um, and again, these systems are incredibly effective. They're incredibly efficient. Okay, it can maintain a, the cellular concentration of calcium at levels ten thousand times lower than the external concentration. So it is really mind blowing just how effective these uh, exchange pumps are. Okay, so what we've done now is that we've essentially uh, focused, we've spent a bit of time looking at simple uh, or passive diffusion and facilitated diffusion. These are both um, uh, movement of substances that do not require energy. They do not require ATP. The next one I wanna talk about is what does need ATP? Now, oh, something I just want to quickly clarify here, just with facilitated diffusion, the pathway itself in terms of, you know, taking glucose, it binds to the binding site, conformational change, and then glucose is released. Yes, that does not take energy. It does still take energy to create the actual protein itself, to create this transporter by, you know, transcription and translation, the whole protein synthesis thing. That needs energy. We need energy to make it. We just don't need energy to use it. So what we're gonna have a look now and focus on is now primary and secondary active transport. Yep. Ooh, yep, there we go, good. Now, big thing here again is with active transport, it is moving against its concentration gradient. Okay, it's going from a low concentration to high concentration. Energy is consumed in the process and we use a lot of energy, okay? On average, just, you know, I wouldn't say like, you know, napkin calculations, but on, you know, estimated is that around 30 plus percent of total metabolic energy is used only on active transport. Like that's huge. Take all the total 
energy that like all the ATPs that you are making in your body and around 30% just boom spent straight away on active transport. It is the tax of the biological systems. (laughs) Now, There are two main types of active transport. We have our primary active transport and we have our secondary active transport. Oh, I can fit there, excellent. Now, I have two main examples here with primary active transport and with secondary active transport. Um, But I wanna try and sort of keep it nice and simple just with this basic schematic for the moment, then we'll use more um, specific examples. So here we have our primary active transport and what is happening? Pardon me. So what is happening here is that we have our substance, whatever it is, we're just going to call it S1. Now we are wishing to move or pump S1 against its concentration gradient. It's a higher concentration outside of the cell than what it is inside of the cell. And we kind of want to keep it that way. We want to maintain that gradient. So we expend ATP and we push our substance out of the cell. Nice and straightforward. And the example I'm going to talk about in greater detail here is the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Now, here's where things get a little bit squirrely. With that sodium glucose um, symporter that we looked at, and I basically said, I'm not gonna talk about that just yet. I'm gonna explain that in a moment that uh, utilizes secondary active transport. So what is that exactly? Does secondary active transport use energy? Not really, kinda. Does the movement or does a, a, a substance that uses secondary active transport use ATP? No, there is no consumption of ATP in this pump here but it does rely on a system that needs ATP. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me break that down a little bit further. Let us look at this um, image over here. Let me, let me do this. So what we see here is the movement of S1 out of the cell. We are using ATP and it's being pumped out. This is the exact same that we saw over here, our primary active transport. Now, what we are establishing with this pump is a chemical gradient. We are creating that S1 is at a higher concentration outside of the cell than what it is inside of the cell because we are spending uh, energy to pump it out. Now, here's the kicker. We have a new substance here called S2, and it is of a higher concentration inside the cell than what it is outside the cell but we want to move it into the cell. How do we do it? Well, with this symporter, what will happen is, is that our S1 will come in and bind to this symporter. And it's going to do this by wanting to move down its concentration gradient. It wants to move from high concentration to low concentration. So our S1 is gonna bind in here, then our S2 will bind in here, and then both will move into the cell. So, does secondary active transport directly consume ATP? No, but the movement of S2 is reliant on this S1 concentration gradient. And that can only be established by pumping S1 from inside, outside and consuming ATP. So I hope that makes sense. I hope that's not too confusing. It might be a little bit easier once we discuss um, some examples. Now, the main pump, this one, the movement of our S1, for instance, I want to talk about that in the form of primary active transport of the sodium potassium ATPase pump, okay? Um, What... Its primary function is, is to establish a sodium and potassium electrochemical gradient to allow sort of our nerves to work, you know, to to help um, generate and propagate action potentials. So what the pump will do is it's going to move three sodium ions um, out of the cell 
and it's going to move two potassiums into the cell. So it's creating that gradient. So let's, let's go through it and talk about it. So here we have our cell. We have our sodium potassium ATPase pump. The first thing that's gonna happen is that we can see that we have three binding sites for sodium and we have two binding sites here for potassium. Now it's exposed to the intracellular side here and we're going to get three sodiums binding to the pump. Once that third sodium is bound, we are going to see a conformational change to this ATP binding site. Once we have that conformational change, it's going to sort of trigger the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP, and with that comes a release of energy and breaking off that inorganic phosphate. So that phosphate is going to bind to that ATP binding site, and the binding of this uh, phosphate to the ATP binding site is going to trigger three conformational changes. And this is important. The first one is probably the most obvious, and that is the sodium potassium ATPase pump has gone from facing inside the cell to now facing outside the cell. The second conformational change is the binding affinity of sodium to the sodium binding sites here drops. It goes down. Why? Why would it want to do that? Well, we don't want sodium bound to the pump anymore. So by lowering that binding affinity, it's going to get rid of those sodiums. It's the same as what we were looking at with um, hemoglobin and how when you know the binding affinity of oxygen to hemoglobin goes down, it will be released. And the third change, the third conformational change is an increase in the binding affinity of potassium. So what is then going to happen is from outside the cell here, potassium is then going to bind to these potassium binding sites. Once the second potassium has bound to this potassium binding site, a conformational change will occur in this ATPase binding site. And what it will do is it will actually cause that inorganic phosphate to leave, okay, to dissociate. Now, what were the three um, conformational changes that occurred when this phosphate bound, which was over here? What were the three things that happened? Well, the pump went from facing inside to facing outside. The binding affinity of sodium decreased and the binding affinity of potassium increased. Okay, makes sense. So if we come back over here and that inorganic phosphate now leaves, what's gonna happen? Well, pretty much these three things go back to how they were. So instead of facing outside, it's now going to face inside. The binding affinity of sodium is going to go up and the binding affinity of potassium is gonna go down. So because that binding affinity of potassium goes down, the potassium is then gonna be released from that pump and we are right back to where we started. So that is the sodium potassium ATPase pump. And I would um, uh, very highly recommend that we know how the sodium potassium ATPase pump functions. All right, so guys, that was a lot of info <laughs> looking at the sodium potassium ATPase pump. What we'll do, let's have a quick 10 minute breather, stand up, stretch your legs, grab a coffee, do what you need to do. And we will keep going. Uh, we'll resume at around 2.35. Alrighty, let's get back into it, crew. 
Let us resume the fun and goodness that is the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Now, again, <clears throat> what we sort of covered here in terms of the, the cycle of the sodium potassium ATPase pump can be a bit uh, overwhelming, I guess. Uh, but what's really important to keep in mind is just the cause and effect, okay? Like, what happened when this phosphate bound to the pump? Well, we had three conformational changes, okay? It went from facing inside the cell to outside the cell. Binding affinity of sodium went down. Binding affinity of potassium went up. Now, if you have that memorized, then this makes it a whole lot easier because when you get over to this step over here, you can just remember, well, okay, if that inorganic phosphate leaves, then the opposite of what happened over here is gonna happen over here. And that is, it's gonna face the inside of the cell. Yeah, it's gonna face the inside of the cell. Binding affinity of sodium is gonna go up and binding affinity of potassium is gonna go down. So that's a cool little shortcut that you can use um, to help you remember this. Now, what's also important to keep in mind with this sodium potassium ATPase pump is that it is establishing and creating a sodium and potassium electrochemical gradient, or, or mainly a, a chemical gradient, I should say, rather, okay, by sort of separating them out. Now, as I said before, that's also, in, that's very important for things like, you know, the resting membrane potential and looking at how your nerves work and blah, blah, blah. But where it's also important is this sodium glucose symporter. Because if I was to rewind back to here, I basically explained secondary active transport as this S2 moving against its concentration gradient because it's able to take advantage of the S1 concentration gradient. So in this example, S1 is sodium. And with our uh, sodium potassium ATPase pump, that is moving against its concentration gradient consuming ATP. So, whoops. If we look here at our sodium potassium symporter, let me zoom in a little bit for you. There we go. And I will do this. So, this right here is our sodium potassium ATPase pump. That's what we were looking at in extensive detail just before. And this is creating our sodium concentration gradient or, or helping to establish it at the very least. Then what is going to happen is with this sodium glucose symporter, glucose is moving against its concentration gradient. So instead of just consuming ATP here, what will happen is this transporter will take advantage of sodium. So sodium moving down its concentration gradient is going to bind to this uh, symporter then glucose can bind, and once both are bound, they both move through into the cytoplasm. So think of it like um, you and your friend are at a party, and you both um, uh, uh, live very close together, or you both live at the at the university. You live at the uh, the student accommodation there, and your friend goes, "Oh, okay, I'm gonna catch an Uber." And they all call up the Uber and they've paid for it. Like the good friend that they are. And you go, oh, hey, can I, uh, can I, get, can I get a lift? Can I get a ride with you? So while your dear loving friend pays for the Uber, you can sort of jump in and grab a free ride. Now, again, does that mean the ride was free? No. Okay. Like we, we had to pay for this ride by creating this sodium concentration gradient by using this sodium potassium ATPase pump. This was primary active transport, but because uh, by taking advantage of that concentration gradient, as sodium moves in, glucose can get a free ride. So I hope that makes sense. Everyone, please let me know if that doesn't make sense. We'll probably cover this again in the, in the shoot workshop. But yeah, it doesn't use energy directly, but it does take advantage of a system or pathway here that does use energy. Now, I obviously can't just play these on, um, on YouTube because it'll just flag for copyright, but there are some good links here. I believe I have these linked on the uh, Moodle portal as well. Um, 
There are such good resources that help break down, explain primary and secondary active transport, especially sites like Crash Course. Um, they, they do explain it really, really well. I highly advise checking those out just as a diversification of different sources in terms of learning this content. Okay, so this is a good little sort of cheeky summary slide here. So simple diffusion, passive diffusion, just keep in mind guys, they are the exact same thing. Oops, sorry, uh, uh, this one. So yeah, simple diffusion, passive diffusion, they're the same thing, don't worry about it. I typically will always refer to it as passive diffusion, but just it, it's just good to keep that in mind. Um, facilitated diffusion, passive transport. I pretty much never call it passive transport because it's too easy to get it muddled up. Um, I will always call it facilitated diffusion. Um, that's, you know, um, using a, a carrier mediated transport or a different transport or protein source in that way. And guys, that's it. 1014 BPS fundamentals of biochemistry is done. There is no more new content to be had. Well done, guys. You made it. You survived. I knew you would. Okay, well done. So what we're going to do now, guys, um, we're going to take five, like five minutes, and then we'll jump into the shoot workshop where we'll have a chat about your assignment. We'll have a chat about your upcoming quiz, which is next week and your end of trimester exam. But look, guys, well done. Congratulations again. And I will see you all in the shoot workshop. Call me a free sober when you shine and change. You give it up like it's over, but never give it away. I don't wanna fall